I'm not saying that it is right for everybody, but I think people can make up their own minds about this, and they have to determine you were years, decades of living with this. There gets a point when you say, I've got to be willing to do something different than what I've been doing, because if it's not working and you're living with the same thing year after year after year, you got to be willing to try something different. I'm not saying this is that something different, but if what you're doing is not working, you either need to change therapists, change modalities, do something, but not just live and continue to suffer. Sometimes people's suffering gets so deeply entrenched, they just think that's the way to live. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, that's for sure. And, and that, is, that is something that need, you, know, you would need to overcome. Um, now, there is one thing that, that I, I believe should be mentioned. There is an African plant called the iboga plant, and there's a psychedelic uh, that's derived from it called ibogaine. And ibogaine is, is the only plant that I'm aware of that a three- or four-day treatment uh, will, can cure a heroin or a cocaine a, a opioid addiction. Absolutely cure it. The individual doesn't want it anymore. Um, and that is, is in Tijuana. There's a number of clinics that, that uh, specialize in that. Now, w- one of the problems with the Ibogaine is it um, uh, can put a strain on an individual's heart. And these clinics uh, are excellent with, you know, monitoring that, you know, and if they tell you, you know, they'll get you through it, they will. But the one thing I will tell you is is anybody that has been treated with uh, Ibogaine will tell you that it is rocket ship intense. They will face everything that they need to face, and it will be harsh. They will vomit a lot. They will, I mean, it, it, is, it is just an unbelievable. An unbelievable thing. Now, uh, with the strain on the uh, heart, is this, that's the reason why, uh, one of the reasons why the FDA uh, has not approved it for use in the United States. Now, Dr. Phil, let me ask you a question. How many people would you say this country lose, uses or loses to uh, uh, opioids? Uh, taken the wrong way or containing fentanyl or, you know, some other stuff like that a year. I think it's in the hundreds of thousands. Yeah, hundreds of thousands. Now, how many people would you think uh, have we lose a year due to not being able to handle uh, Ibogaine? I would think it's a very low number. About two or three. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have um, some friends and I had three, three of them, and they all had their sons uh, that were uh, uh, addicted to heroin. And, and I, I pointed them to these clinics in, in, in Mexico, and they opted that, you know, they said, no, I can't send my son down there, you know, and put him through that. Two of those three are now dead from overdoses. So, and, and I mean... They would not have died if they went down to um, uh, Tijuana and found the right clinic. Well, I think enabling is a word that gets overused so much that people don't really think about what it means. But so often, parents that I believe and label as enabling their kids on drugs whether it's giving them a place to stay or giving them money or looking the other way or whatever, because they say, I don't want to find out that my kid's dead under a bridge somewhere. I think they're basically doing that not because they want to keep their child alive, but because they don't want to face the anxiety of worrying about whether their child's going to be alive or not. I think they just don't want to face the hard choices of putting their grown kid, their teenager or 20-something, on a hard path. They put them out. Maybe they're going to wind up in a bad situation. But we know for sure if they don't put them on that hard path, they're going to continue to shoot and poison 
in their veins, and they're going to die for sure. That stuff will kill you if they don't get them on a hard path and make the tough choices to get off the drugs. Like you say, maybe two or three people a year die. That's going to be tough for their kid. Maybe their kid's going to be mad at them, but I'd rather have my kid mad at me than dead. Oh, absolutely. I, I don't understand how parents justify that to themselves. They're doing that to make themselves feel better, not to make their child healthier. I, I just don't get that. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I just, they, they don't want to face that. But let me ask you something. The Marines, it seems to me, changed your life in a huge, huge way to this day. They've written on the slate of who Bob Parsons is. Fair statement? Yeah, it's absolutely a fair statement. It also left you with a very debilitating disease in PTSD. If you knew then what you know now, would you do it again? Yes, I would. And and the reason the reason is is uh you know is 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 much of that cross that I had to carry because of it, uh, you know, I, I and and as much as grief as it caused everybody around me, uh, that is what broke me out of the that cycle of poverty that I was in in Baltimore, and it was that uh, that that family that that I, I I fell into in the Marine Corps, and it was the first time I really belonged to something that mattered, that really taught me what I needed to what I needed to know. Now they did often their lessons came with a boot in the ass, but, uh, you know, that's just, a, that's the Marine Corps. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's when, when I was wounded in Vietnam, I'll tell you how strong this is. I was wounded after I was wounded. I didn't have to go back, uh, because I, when I got to Okinawa and I still wasn't healed up right, I went in this this uh, casualty company, and when I finally did get healed up enough, the doctor there was a really good guy. He said uh, he said to me, uh, "Son, you know if if you've done your part, if if you want, I will keep you here on uh, Okinawa for the duration of your enlistment." And so I'd rotate home, and I wouldn't have to go back. Well, I said, "Doc, I want to go back." And then, then he, he, you know, finally put the orders through for me to do it. And then I, I met a friend of mine who it was an unbelievable coincidence. Uh, I saved this guy's life the first night I was in the bush. And this, this guy, I ran into him on Okinawa. He had been wounded. And it was the third time uh, for him in the Marine Corps. If you're wounded three times, you can get out of, out of combat. And, and he took and— uh, uh, said, you know, I can get you this job for this guy that just rotated and you won't have to go back to a rifle company. And I told him, I said, brother, I, 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 don't, I don't mind going back. And any, anyhow, so we got it done. And, and that's why I didn't go back the first time. The other two times I put in a request for transfer to go back. And both times the company gunnery sergeant tore it up in front of me and just said, you'll get yourself killed. You're probably right. You know, but so uh, the point I'm trying to make is that family pool, that, that camaraderie is so strong that I'd have done anything to be with those guys. I loved them. Still do to this day. Yeah. Yeah. Like Brownie's sitting over here. I'd love you, Brownie. Yeah. He's waving to me. 